Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, I'm sorry there isn't more room, but come on in. Uh, if anybody is sitting next to an empty seat, I feel like I'm at a wedding. Uh, if there's anybody <laughs> sitting next to an empty seat, raise your hand. Oh, there are no hands raised. Okay, well then I'm just going to plunge in. Uh, yes, so my plan is to tell you about 13.7 years, a billion years of cosmic evolution. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. You can imagine that I will leave out some details. In fact, I'll probably leave out citations to all your colleagues and mine. Uh, not quite, not quite. I do want to talk about this. This is a special uh, moment, really, because the um, recognition that uh, these exploding stars, like this one, can tell you about the structure of the universe and the location of the galaxies and the history of cosmic expansion is the message I have for you today. Coming events cast their shadows before them. The Gruber Cosmology Prize was awarded for this work uh, to the High Z Supernova team and the Supernova Cosmology Project, the two groups that were working on this. Uh, and then uh, just in November, uh, well, in December, uh, we all went to Stockholm uh, for the uh, Nobel Prize. So let me tell you a word about that, and we'll get that out of the way. Uh, I have to say, this is actually a more august group than you would find on the stage uh, at the Nobel Prize ceremonies because uh, although there are some super duper scientists on the, uh, on the stage, there are also there's hereditary, no, hereditary nobility and uh, economists. So, you know, <laughs> all I'm just saying. <laughs> so uh, this prize was awarded to Saul Perlmutter, to Brian Schmidt, and Adam Reese for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. And what I'm going to tell you about is the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. And I feel I can do this uh, because uh, we all wore the right clothes. There's me over there. Here are the guys who won the, this. so here's Adam and Brian uh, who uh, won the Nobel Prize, both of them. Uh, were my graduate students, and they forgot to wear the little buttons I made for them <laughs> when they were on the stage. <laughs> Apparently, that's not considered proper protocol. So this story starts sort of in 1917, 1916, with Albert Einstein trying to think about applying his newly invented general relativity to the universe as a whole. And what astronomers assured him was the universe is this, the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy in which we live. Should we dim the lights a little? There's a danger that people will fall asleep, but I'll talk louder. And that will, you know, that will irritate them so much they'll stay awake. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so here is the uh, Milky Way. Uh, of course, there's no place on Earth where you can stand and see the whole Milky Way. This is both the northern and the southern part. What turns out to be interesting is that the astronomers of 1917 assured Einstein this was the universe, but in fact, it's not. And it's these little fuzzy things, which we call galaxies, which they called nebulae back then, uh, which turn out to be the interesting thing. But that was not known at the time when Einstein set up um, his interpretation of general relativity for the universe. Now here's a picture of Einstein. The thing I want to emphasize is technology and the change in technology. Uh, uh, here's a picture of Einstein taken with photographic technology. Light falls on silver halides and people dip things into chemicals and the silver becomes metal and oh my goodness, it's quite a complicated thing. Uh, compared to using a CCD, I'll tell you that. Anyway, uh, what you can see is that chemical process is actually quite inefficient, and uh, during the time the shutter was open, while Einstein was looking at the camera, this guy was clearly in disagreement with Einstein, and this person <laughs> got up and left. <laughs> if you take a picture today using a digital imager under low light conditions like that, you'd still have that other guy in the picture. And you wouldn't know what this person was thinking. Now, that's the other thing. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed methods now for finding out what people were thinking. And what's interesting is that Einstein was thinking the universe must be static. That this universe, which was the Milky Way, made of stars whose velocities were small and not systematic, not coming or going from us, he thought that the universe must be uh, static. 
But it turns out that uh, the other half of the technological piece here is the development of telescopes. And as the World War I ended, the uh, operation of big telescopes that uh, George Ellery Hale had been building at Mount Wilson, this is the mountain up behind uh, Pasadena, near Los, the little village of Los Angeles, which had 25,000 people and very little street lighting uh, at the time. Here's the telescope uh, that they built. I draw your attention to this chair up here. Woohoo! There's the chair. And in a second, I'll show you somebody sitting in that chair, uh, operating the telescope and exposing a photographic plate. What people discovered in the early part of the 20th century were where they were able to measure the distances inside uh, the Milky Way galaxy using this telescope and others by looking at stars whose brightness we know. So by measuring how bright they appear, you can figure out how far away they are. And it's from that kind of measurement that we know that the Milky Way galaxy in which we live, and which New Haven is located about there, <laughs> Milky Way galaxy in which we live is about 100,000 light years across. So it would, take, it would take light traveling at the speed of light, which is not just a metaphor, but an actual speed. Uh, the, spe it's a, the speed of light is a foot uh, in a nanosecond, in a billionth of a second. Uh, so it takes time for light to travel across this room. So I see the people in the front as they, not as they are, but as they were six or eight nanoseconds ago. And curiously, the people in the back look younger because I see the light that was emitted from them quite a long time ago. <laughs> now that's just uh, an amusing idea in this room, but of course in the universe this is not a joke, that the telescope actually works as a time machine and lets us see the light that was emitted at, in the past. So we can actually see the light from the past. And that's what Hubble was doing at the 100-inch telescope. Here he is at that chair. Photographic plate would be mounted up here, and those big wheels are to keep the telescope pointed exactly at the same place as it tracks across the sky. Um, Edwin Hubble was able to show, by the same technique I just described, finding stars in these fuzzy nebulae, which were the same as stars uh, in our own galaxy and in the uh, other systems we knew about, he could find those stars, measure their brightness, and from their apparent brightness, figure out how far away uh, the nebulae were. And what he showed was that our own Milky Way has a dimension of roughly 100,000 light years. The distances to the nearby nebulae are 10 times as big, a million light years. And so it's no problem. And you can do it on a, on a fall night. You can go, well, not quite downtown. But anyway, if you go outside of town a little bit, you can see the light from the Andromeda Nebula, from M31, which uh, Hubble uh, worked on um, to measure the distances and to show that the Milky Way is not the whole universe. It's a universe of galaxies, uh, each of which is more or less equivalent to the Milky Way. And Edwin Hubble wrote a famous book, The Realm of the Nebulae, which uh, is, uh, was published by Yale University Press. It was a Silliman lecture. And it's going to have a new edition with a new foreword. <laughs> and I'm writing it. <laughs> OK. I promise. I signed the contract. I'll sign the contract. OK, so here's uh, the Andromeda Nebula. Hubble was able to see individual stars in this and show that it, these, this fuzzy thing was not in the Milky Way. These are, in fact, the constituents of the universe. And this is not. Uh, what Einstein understood in 1917. There's something else about those uh, galaxies that's interesting. Not only are they far from us, but they are moving away from us. And the way we know that is by measuring the light from, the, from these uh, galaxies, spreading it out into a spectrum, and seeing that the lines, which are caused by the atoms in the atmospheres of the stars, the lines in the spectra of the galaxies are stretched to the red by the expansion of the universe. The fellow who did this uh, to start with is shown here, Vesto Melvin Slipher, who worked at the Lowell Observatory, and he measured the spectra uh, of these nebulae. And he found that although there are a few of them coming toward us, including the Andromeda Nebula that I showed you a second ago, which is approaching us, check your homeowner's insurance, uh, most of the galaxies are moving away from us. 
So here's a picture of uh, Einstein visiting the Mount Wilson Observatory Library uh, on Santa Barbara Street in Pasadena. The library looks exactly the same. In fact, they haven't even erased the blackboard, as far as I know. <laughs> Einstein, here's Michelson, he won the Nobel Prize, good, good work. Here's Hubble, he did not win the Nobel Prize. Here is uh, um, uh, George Ellery Hale patting Hubble on the head. <laughs> Congratulations, he said, you've done fine work. Here's Hummison, who actually measured the redshifts, that's good. Uh, well, anyway, here they are, Einstein visiting Mount Wilson after uh, the discovery of the thing we call Hubble's Law, which is the n idea that these two things, the distances that Hubble was measuring and the velocities, which at first were being measured by Slipher and then later by Hummison and, and Sandage, uh, no, <laughs> and some of, yeah, well, Sandage too, Hummison and, oh my goodness, and Hubble, uh, and later Sandage, uh, uh, that the velocities and the distance were proportional to one another. So here are Hubble's distances out this way, Notoriously inaccurate, but never mind that. Here are the velocities. These were actually taken from Slipher without citation, but that's all right. And here is the relation between velocity and distance uh, as first seen in 1929. Uh, we call this Hubble's Law. Hubble called it figure one. Um, <laughs> where you can see that as you look at more distant galaxies, you see a, a, a trend toward a higher velocity away from us. So what's the interpretation of that? Well, uh, Meg was kind enough to mention that I, I'm at Harvard, and there most of the students and all of the faculty believe that they, personally, are at the center of the universe. And so <laughs> most of them have this picture in their mind when you talk about the Hubble Law. They say, well, it must be me. I must be at the center of things and the other galaxies somehow know enough to uh, recede from us. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is not the current picture. The current picture is, of course, that the universe that's out there, a universe of galaxies, is stretching apart in all directions, and that there's nothing special, or at least we think there's nothing special about our own galaxy that distinguishes it from the others. So, uh, you know, if you think of the history of science, you think of people imagining that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Most of you have heard this is not the current uh, idea. <laughs> then there might be the notion, well, all right, the Earth goes around the sun. Maybe the sun was at the center of things. No, I just showed you a picture. And, you know, everybody laughed when I said New Haven, way out there, the sun, our star, is not at the center of our own galaxy. And it seems like it would be a kind of willful uh, uh, misunderstanding for us to think that out of all the galaxies out there, that somehow ours has a special or privileged position. So the question is, how do you understand Hubble's law, where everyone's going away from us, and the idea that we have no special position? And of course, the notion is that we live in a universe that's expanding in all directions, and it would look the same uh, to any observer. Now, uh, when people teach this uh, idea at uh, large universities or small, they often resort to a very homely sort of uh, metaphor, which uh, I found on uh, a NASA website. And here it shows a loaf of raisin bread, <laughs> which has raisins in it. And as the loaf rises, all the raisins get farther apart. What's more, if you take the point of view of any raisin, you get this extended metaphor. If you take the uh, point of view of any of these uh, raisins, you will see the other raisins moving away from you. What's more, <laughs> the nearby raisins are moving away from you slowly, while the distant ones moving more rapidly. Uh-huh. <laughs> that is really dumb. OK. <laughs> but I don't have a better one today, <laughs> for reasons that I don't have time to explain. <laughs> All right. So uh, what did Einstein do? Uh, Einstein had put into his equations by hand an extra term, this so-called cosmological term or cosmological constant, to make a static universe because he thought that's what the astronomers wanted. But now the astronomers are telling me it's expanding. So uh, here's uh, uh, Willem de Sitter, who was uh, a leading astronomer 
who, uh, in Leiden who n could actually understand what Einstein had written uh, and translated it for many astronomers. Uh, and uh, together, they thought, all right, let's get rid of that cosmological constant, this anti-gravity kind of a thing that balances out uh, the universe, and we'll just have a universe that's always expanding and always decelerating. Isn't that what you had in your paper? Yeah, something like that. In the secret language of astronomers, we call that uh, Q-naught. The deceleration would be positive and have a value of a half. So we wanted to get rid of the cosmological constant. What's so interesting is that's the way we used to tell the story, but, you know, after the trip to Stockholm, now we have to change our story. So we have to have new heroes, but from the past. So here's uh, Georges Lemaitre, who has a kind of unusual combination of uh, initials after his name. So he was a Jesuit, and he had a PhD from MIT. And uh, he was one of the first people to think in a physical way about what the universe, what the cosmic expansion might be. He imagined that there might have been a hot, dense Big Bang. So he, that was a good thought. And uh, he thought that the expansion might take place as though the energy in the vacuum was different from zero. So the vacuum, the empty space, was not devoid of properties. It had a property. And the property it had was a negative pressure, a pressure P equals minus rho C squared, to the, uh, that we associate a pressure to the energy density of the vacuum. This is the meaning of the cosmological constant lambda. So this, it turns out, this is just what people say today, as I'll show you. We, we need something like this to make the universe that we see today, which is an expanding one that is accelerating, uh, expanding faster and faster over time. And the thing that can do that is a negative pressure, something that it's like tension would be a, maybe a better word for it. So here's Lemaitre, who had that idea. And here is a, a, a kind of visu a visual representation of lambda, the cosmological constant, making the universe swell up. This is uh, from a Dutch newspaper. but. English is a dialect of Frisian, so it's easy for us to read it. Uh, who, however, makes the ball makes the blow up? The ball blow up. What the ball up? What makes the ball? What makes the ball up? What makes the universe expand or swell up? Up, swelt. That has to be lambda. You, no other answer can be given. Well, pretty good. Okay, I have it written down here in case I lose track. Okay, so. There, is at least, there were at least some people in the 1930s, after the discovery of the expansion of the universe, who did not abandon the cosmological constant. And what I'll show you is that the modern version now requires something like it, something that acts like the cosmological constant, something that acts to make the universe expand faster over time, something that acts like a negative pressure. Okay. Well, how did we learn that? Well, it's the same old story. It says we have no ideas in this subject, except uh, uh, we're looking at the brightness of stars, only this time the stars that we're looking at are exploding stars, supernovae. They're a million times brighter than the stars that Hubble used to measure the distances to the galaxies back in the 1920s. And that means we can see them, even with the same equipment, a thousand times as far away. So instead of measuring distances of a few million light years, with this kind of explosion, you can measure distances of billions of light years. And we think that the time back to the Big Bang is about 13.7 billion years. This means that we have a way to measure those distances and those times uh, with good precision, as I'll show you, uh, over a fair fraction of the whole age of the universe. These exploding stars, so here's a uh, galaxy. Galaxy has in it about 100 billion stars, roughly speaking. And for a little while, there's one of them, this is a star in that galaxy exploding. So there's one of them which is as bright as about 4 billion stars like the sun. So we've measured these things. And it turns out that the range of brightness for these stars is fairly small. And that's a key point because it allows us to judge the distances with good accuracy. So this sounds like exactly the right thing to do. You assign your graduate students, study that galaxy, wait till a supernova explodes, measure its brightness. <laughs> the problem is that they are rare. They're about one per century in a galaxy. For example, we live in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Has anybody here seen a supernova in the Milky Way galaxy? Well, not recently. The last one in the Milky Way galaxy was seen 
by Kepler, and the one before that was seen by Tycho. And this is a picture taken with an iPhone of Tycho <laughs> as he went outside his castle and looked up there to see this bright star up in Cassiopeia, uh, which is the supernova of 1572, the one that we call Tycho's supernova. He just called it my supernova. <laughs> Superno and if you go to look at that spot now, if you take an optical picture, you can see stars and some a little bit of light from the location. What's also shown here is X-ray emission. This green stuff, is, fluffy stuff, is X-ray emission from the hot interior of this uh, supernova remnant. This is the shredded star. This is the material that uh, um, is left over after the star, which is mostly carbon and oxygen, burns in a sudden thermonuclear flash up to silicon and iron. And so silicon and iron are things we see here. The explosion goes out into the gas between the stars and makes this uh, little ridge of uh, radio emission that makes Tycho's uh, supernova remnant uh, such a powerful radio source. So there are a lot of new things here, a lot of new technologies. But it gives you the idea, for sure, that there was a more or less spherical explosion that took place. And, <laughs> and we can measure the expansion. We can see that this really is the event from 1572. Now, we should have an interest in these things. After all, every one of us has coursing through their body uh, uh, red blood cells with uh, hemoglobin in them. And you might ask yourself, well, where did the iron that makes the hemoglobin red come from? And the answer is supernovae, supernovae that went off before the formation of uh, the Earth and of the Sun. So in the sense we're all star material, that's a good thought, I think. Uh, and uh, we really are made from the ashes of uh, uh, exploded stars. Here's something else that's made from the ashes of exploded stars. It's a Pontiac. Uh, and you might say, well, where was this made? You know, and a very short-sighted person might say, well, that was made in Detroit. That's not the whole story. Yes, but it really was manufactured in a supernova. 3,200 pounds of iron. What a car. Okay. And we have some idea of how this happens, that uh, at the end of its life, a star like the Sun will make a dense little nugget of carbon and oxygen we call a white dwarf. It's held up by quantum mechanical forces. Could be stable, but many stars are in binary systems. The Sun, of course, is not. But many stars are. And we think that either the merger of another white dwarf or the transfer of mass from some neighbor star, some very generous neighbor, uh, leads to the explosion uh, of the white dwarf, it leads to the phenomenon we see uh, that has been a, that we use to measure the distances to these things. Okay, so, so here's something a little more modern. Actually, <laughs> we probably ought to update this. But anyway, this is hu a Hubble diagram for these uh, particular kind of exploding stars. This is distance out here. And here's velocity going up that way. Uh, for each supernova explosion on this diagram, we have measured how bright the supernova is, and from that inferred how distant it is. And then we've also measured how much the spectrum is stretched out by the expansion of the universe and plotted that up here. So this is a plot of velocity and distance, the same thing that was on that Hubble diagram from 1929, except Hubble's Hubble diagram would fit in this little square down here, this little red square, down here, Kremlin on one side, Goom department store on the other, you know. Anyway, uh, here's the relation between velocity and distance, a nice straight line in this plot of linear velocity versus distance. The distance is in megaparsecs, just in case the physicists walk into the room. We want to make sure that we have some secret knowledge and they have to ask us, what is that? That's a unit of distance, about three light years, and so this picture covers <coughs> sorry, the most distant supernovae in the picture uh, in this little bit of the diagram are at a distance of about 2 billion light years. So about one-seventh of the way back to the Big Bang. This is just nearby. And the law is linear nearby. Okay, and uh, here for the professionals, just so you'll feel more at home, here's the current or nearly current uh, data sample uh, for several hundred uh, supernovae. Uh, and this is a log-log plot, 
to suppress all errors. Uh, and what <laughs> anyway, and what you see here is that the supernovae make very good uh, standard candles. They make very good uh, distance estimators, and they help us uh, determine the current rate of expansion to good precision, to a few percent. Uh, we think we know the rate at which the universe is expanding today. And that was done by uh, Malcolm Hicken, uh, who was a graduate student of mine uh, just a couple of years ago. Okay, so uh, now we, that's nearby, universe expanding, and we have a tool that we can use to great distances. So now we're ready. We're ready to ask the question, what's the history of cosmic expansion? We want to look deep into the past. Now this picture was taken with a charge coupled device, a silicon detector like the thing that's in uh, a camera that you could buy, well, people used to buy cameras, now they just have phones with the auxiliary <laughs> to weapons. Anyway, uh, this is a picture taken by starlight. Uh, and it's not a very long exposure. And you can see the four meter dome at Cerro Tololo. You can see our Milky Way, the clouds of Magellan over there. And there's no problem taking a picture by starlight uh, with these modern detectors. Compared to the chemical detectors, the silver halide detectors, they're about 100 times more efficient. So the same telescope using uh, this kind of instrument um, is 100 times better than the old instruments, uh, than, the, than the old methods on the same telescopes. Okay, and here's what we want to do. We're, here's a diagram that's supposed to show you how the universe has changed. Think of it as the distance between any two galaxies. So here are two galaxies. And over time, if the universe is expanding, the distance is getting bigger. So that's what this is on the vertical axis, the distance between two galaxies. If the universe is expanding but slowing down, decelerating, this curve will curve downward. If the universe is accelerating, I hate to spoil the surprise, but this is what we're going to find. The, if the universe is accelerating, then as time goes by, that distance will increase more rapidly. So here's the present. There's no time like the present. We'll look back into the past and make a plot of how big the universe was at different distances or different times uh, in the past. And we can do that with the two things that I talked about, measuring the brightness of the supernova and uh, the stretching of its spectrum. That's enough information to put a point uh, on this kind of diagram. What we're not so good at is seeing into the future. Okay? Otherwise, astronomers would be very wealthy people. Uh, we do not see into the future. Uh, we don't know for sure whether the expansion of the universe that we see today will persist or not. If the uh, universe is dominated today by a dark energy which is exactly like the cosmological constant, then the expansion will be literally exponential. The rate will depend on the current value of the size. Uh, and that will be the future of the universe. And it's possible that it increases even faster than that, which is hardly worth thinking, hardly bears thinking about. OK. Uh, so here's one of those. This is uh, Bev Oak, who was my thesis advisor. Uh, here he is very happy because he is holding one of the world's largest charge couple devices uh, at the time. Yes, 0.24 megapixels. <laughs> Here's a modern picture of an astronomer. This is John Tonry, a member of the Hi-Z team. And he's happy too, you can tell. He's happy, even though you can't see his mouth, but you can tell he's happy. And he's got an array here of silicon, which is as big as the photographic plates that Hubble had which has got in it a thousand megapixels, a gigapixel. Oh, no wonder he's so happy. Uh, and this is the kind of detector with which you can make measurements that allow you to survey many galaxies and look for distant supernova explosions, as I'll show you in a second. So we didn't have a detector quite as good as that one, but anyway, we had uh, something in between uh, during the time when Brian Schmidt was a graduate student. So here's Brian Schmidt explaining to his thesis advisor how easy it's going to be to find distant supernovae. All he has to do is write the software. And I said, well, that's all very good, but uh, you know, there's this other team, Saul Perlmutter's team, the Supernova Cosmology Project. They've been working on this for five years, and that's three people, or maybe four, so that's 
15 man years of software effort. And he said, yes, he said, yes. It probably will take me all month. And so, it <laughs> and it did. And it was terrible software. It used to break all the time, and it would only work anyway. Uh, but it did work. It did work. Here's the idea. The idea is these are digital images. So here's a picture of a little piece of the sky uh, from, let's say, tonight. And here's a picture that you have stored in the memory of your computer from some other time, say, a month ago. Turns out these supernovae take about a month uh, to get bright. So since these are digital images, arrays of numbers, you can literally subtract one from the other. There are some uh, subtleties to this. But anyway, you can <laughs> subtract one from the other. And that means that things that do not change will go away. And you'll only have left over the things that are new in the picture from tonight. So this galaxy was in both pictures. And when you look at the subtraction, it's gone. But up here, it's very hard to tell what's going on. Nevertheless, when you take the difference image, there is a dot left over. And you're sure it's real because there's a red circle around it. <laughs> that shows that this is the real thing. OK, uh, the, there are false positives. There's, this is more complicated than I've said, but uh, that is basically the method. And that meant we could find distant supernovae, measure their brightness, and uh, uh, infer their distance, and trace out this history of cosmic expansion. What Adam Rees did was, as, as a student was to take into account the way in which dust in other galaxies and in our own would diminish the light from a distant supernova. You can see in this picture that uh, there are these clouds of dust in this particular direction. Uh, which are absorbing some of the light from behind. If you had a supernova that was behind a cloud of dust, it would look dimmer than it ought to for its distance. In other words, if you saw it and you didn't know about the cloud of dust, you'd say, oh, that supernova must be farther away. As if the expansion of the universe had been bigger over the time while the light was in travel to you as if the universe were accelerating. So the point is you cannot tell the difference until you solve this problem. You cannot tell the difference between a universe with boring old dust in it uh, and a universe with this very exciting, accelerating uh, property of the universe. Many people prefer dust, I would say. <laughs> but, we'll show, but we learned how to make these measurements. We're quite sure that that's not the right story. And Adam uh, really got going on that for his thesis. So here's a picture of Adam. Uh, with, uh, in Massachusetts, it's okay to have two dads. And uh, here's Bill Press, <laughs> who's now, and uh, here's me. <laughs> Jeez, here's Adam <laughs> in 1996. That's a funny picture. Okay, okay, so uh, Adam worked on this business of uh, measuring the distances to things. So here's the idea again a supernova is a rare thing, it's one in a, one in a century, one in a thousand, hundred years century, 100 years. That's one in 5,000 weeks. OK, take a few couple of weeks off for vacation. Uh, so if you look at 5,000 galaxies, your chances of finding a nice fresh supernova are pretty good. They're pretty good. And if you look in this picture, well, you see galaxy, 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 galaxy. But the ones we're really interested in are not these nice big ones where you can see what's going on. They're these. These are galaxies, too. And by doing this subtraction very, very well, you can tell whether one of those has brightened by 10% or so, whether there is a supernova explosion in one of these distant galaxies. Then you can go out and measure it carefully, and you can uh, measure the redshift, the, the stretching of the light, and put it on the diagram to measure the history of cosmic expansion. Well, as I've mentioned, there were two groups in the field. Uh, and here we have. Brian, and here's uh, Saul Perlmutter, and we had a uh, uh, full and frank exchange of views <laughs> on some uh, important topics. Uh, they published first, and here's the publication, Measurements of the Cosmological Parameters from Seven Supernovae. And what they found was that omega matter, that is the fraction of the universe that's made up of gravitating stuff, was 0.88, pretty close to 1, for a lambda equals zero cosmology, for a no dark energy. The results uh, are inconsistent with lambda-dominated, low-density, flat cosmologies 
that's the right answer, are inconsistent with the right answer that have been proposed to reconcile the ages of globular cluster stars with higher Hubble constant values. So the first work was a very small sample, and it seemed to point in the direction of a s universe that was slowing down. But things got better fast. <coughs> uh, we were working in the field, and they also were uh, getting more data. Adam was a student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And there, although they don't do a lot of poetry, they learn to keep lab notebooks. And here is his lab notebook. <laughs> and it says up there, Hubble results, and blah, 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 and so on. And it turns out, he says, well, if he assumes that the universe has no cosmological constant, no dark energy, then he gets um, the fraction of the universe that's in the form of gravitating matter was minus 0.36. Adam needs a lot of feedback, so he called me up. He said, I, I got the result, and it's minus 0.36. And I said, I think, I think you might have made a mistake here. Uh, how could you get negative mass? He said, well, well, good point. Yes, I'll go back and check this. Anyway, we checked this as carefully as we could and found that this was, of course, the problem was not the value of the mass, it's that we had assumed there was no cosmological constant, no acceleration. And you can find another solution that matches the data uh, if you allow for that. So you need something, the universe is actually speeding up. And I, probably I should speed up too. <laughs> okay, because all the funny stuff is at the end. Uh, so here's, a, here's one of those diagrams I showed you before. Before I showed you that the points were lying on a diagonal line and that was good. Now, you can't really see it, but these lines diverge. This is the history of the universe shown on that kind of diagram of redshift and uh, brightness, redshift and distance. Uh, and the idea is that if the universe is speeding up or slowing down, it'll make a difference in this diagram. Here's how it works. Supernova goes off. The light travels from it to you. And during the time it's in flight, the universe expands. If the universe is slowing down, then the distance that it has to travel is smaller. If the universe is speeding up, the distance it has to travel is bigger, and the, and the supernova will appear a little dimmer. And so you can see here, uh, we've drawn these different lines, taken out the 45 degrees now, uh, and what you see is, uh, if the universe were slowing down the way most people expected, uh, especially if they'd read that other paper. Anyway, if people, if the universe were slowing down the way most people expected, it would lie along this line. If the universe were slowing down but just by the amount you'd expect for the amount of matter we're pretty sure is present in the universe, it would be on this horizontal line. Now, you do not have the advantage of the powerful tools of Bayesian inference that we used on this uh, meager data set with the big errors, but the points really do lie above that line, and that's the direction of acceleration. That's the direction of a universe that's speeding up. And while the data here are pretty noisy, uh, nevertheless, it, they make a good case uh, for the, a universe that has in it both dark energy and dark matter. So now here's the first of these spooky diagrams. If this makes you uneasy, just close your eyes for a minute, it will pass. <laughs> this way is the uh, is the amount of dark energy. This way is the amount of uh, dark matter or ma gravitating matter. And the evidence from the supernovae picked out this part of the diagram, these uh, big zeppelins up here. And what you can see is that the heart of the diagram is up here for high values of the cosmological constant or something like it, something that makes the universe speed up. And, uh, well, okay, so that's the old data, and it seemed, and what we show here is the data from both groups, that's right, the, the solid lines, of course, are us, the, the dashed lines are the other guys, uh, and you can see that from the data, the two data sets, which are mostly independent, uh, we got the same result. Here's a modern version of the data, where what we've been doing over the last 10 years, of course, is filling this in, many more points at high redshift and higher redshifts many in the middle, uh, many at low redshift, and here's that uh, horizontal line that corresponds to the fit, only this time the fit is a curved line. You can't see it, but I can. Oh yeah. Uh, it's a curved line that corresponds to a universe that's speeding up. So the modern data uh, uh, really does confirm this early result. 
Here's a way to see that. Here's that old diagram I showed you before. And uh, the, you can see the error ellipses on there. Here's the modern error ellipse uh, from the current data sets. And the supernova data have gone from being this great big uncertainty to this small one by hard work, by building up the uh, data set. And we're very, you know, that's been a worldwide effort. A lot of people have done it. Those people in Sweden are very conservative, you know. They don't <laughs> want to give out a prize for something that's totally wrong. Uh, and I think the evidence has been coming in over the uh, intervening decade or so uh, that really shows that uh, this idea is right, that the universe is accelerating. Here I show some other things. Here's this supernova ellipse. And then uh, this green thing has to do with uh, galaxy clustering. It turns out the history of the gathering together of matter in the universe depends on the amount of matter and the history of the expansion. So it turns out that this, which you can measure, uh, intersects with the supernova somewhere up here. This is a line that reflects evidence from the glow, from the Big Bang itself, the cosmic microwave background. These, of course, any two lines have to cross. But three lines don't have to cross in the, in the same place. The fact that they do is a good sign, I think. And it converges on this picture where the universe is about two-thirds dark energy and one-third uh, the dark matter, or dark gravitating matter. So that's kind of a funny picture. If you, if you ask, uh, what is it that the supernova really tell you? Turns out, uh, they tell you about the age of the universe. If you, uh, I've plotted here lines of constant age, 10, 11, 12, 13 billion years, 14 billion years, 15 billion years. And what you can see is that the supernova observations lie uh, pretty much along those lines. And they pick out a, a solution, which is this age of the universe of about 13.7 uh, billion years. Okay. So uh, this seems to be real. It has been endorsed by the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, the Nobel Prize in Physics, and the main department of motor vehicles, which has the Accelerating Universe license plate, <laughs> which was issued to me. Uh, and at the Nobel Prize ceremony, uh, you know, Adam and Brian kind of felt sorry for the rest of us because, you know, they got the big gold medal. But we got. We got the cufflinks, which they had made, which are Q naught less than zero. That's astronomer talk for an accelerating universe. So we wear those whenever we're in the company of the Supernova Cosmology Project. And here is uh, 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 more evidence. This is from the glow from the Big Bang that I talked about before. What it really tells you about is the sum of the energy that's in gravitating matter and uh, the part of the universe that's in this, uh, uh, associated with the vacuum, this dark energy. Um, we know that there's dark matter in the universe. There's no doubt about it. We see its effects. We see the bending of light. You can see here these uh, uh, arcs, which are the result of the mass that's associated with these galaxies, even though it's not glowing. Even though it's not stars that are glowing, there is a lot more mass in clusters of galaxies and in galaxies themselves including the Milky Way galaxy, there's a lot more mass than uh, is uh, in the visible stars. And so this solution that uh, corresponds to the things that I just mentioned, the clustering of galaxies and to the cosmic microwave background, is what gives you this uh, rather well-defined uh, uh, value in which the, about two-thirds of the universe is in this form of the stuff that makes the universe speed up, which we call the dark energy. Uh, so here's a diagram that shows the dark energy, most of the universe, the dark matter. Turns out we know from other arguments about the cooking in the Big Bang that uh, uh, most of that cannot be in the form of the atoms of the periodic table. It can't be made of neutrons and protons. That neutrons and protons, the stuff we're made of, can only be about 4% of the universe. This uh, dark matter is about 23%, and the dark energy, um, the balance. Now, my theoretical colleagues are extremely proud of this diagram. They say, look, it is full. <laughs> you should always ask, what is it full of? <laughs> and, and in this case, it is full of our most important resource, which is ignorance, or as we like to call it, opportunity. There are th 
that means that somebody in this room has a chance to find out what the dark matter is. And somebody in this room, and it's not me, has a chance to find out what the dark energy is. There's a lot missing in this picture. I don't know how it makes you feel, either, to be part of the 4%. <laughs> Uh, but it doesn't seem very sensible, I'll tell you that. Here's a picture of uh, someone wearing a t-shirt, that's my wife, uh, and uh, here's what the t-shirt says. The universe is under no obligation to make sense, but your PhD thesis better. <laughs> uh, I didn't make these t-shirts, I bought it. I bought it, and when I went to the place where they had them, kind of a funny story, I guess. I went to the place where they had them, I said, hey, I'm Robert P. Kirshner. They said, we'll give you a good discount. <laughs> So what is this dark energy? Well, one way to find out what it might be, uh, in the old days, before the uh, uh, academic institutions with an agenda to promote uh, started camping out on the, on the web to get their, uh, you know, so, the, so that uh, you would find them, it used to be that when you would Google dark energy, you got this. <laughs> From American Hydroponics, this is plant food so that you can grow controlled substances in your closet. <laughs> It says, uh, on the advertising copy, says, these specialized processes are also responsible for the very distinct odor of dark energy. So <laughs> we don't know what it is, but we know it smells bad. If you ask a theoretical physicist, would you kindly estimate for me the energy associated with gravitation in the vacuum? They will do it. They shoot their cuffs, they pull out their Mont Blanc pen, they take an envelope and look on the back, and here's the envelope. And they write something that has the Planck mass to the fourth power in it, uh, which is a very big number. Here it's 10 to the 120th. Okay, it might only be 10 to the 60th. Anyway, 10 to the 120th, a 1 with 120 zeros, where the correct answer is 0.7. <laughs> in academic circles, we say, not good quantitative agreement. Uh, it's a sure sign that we don't understand quantum gravity, and that's, you know, that's no uh, that's not exactly news. Uh, there are other possibilities uh, about the dark energy. It might be something that is not exactly the cosmological constant. It could be something, for example, that is cosmological but not constant, could change over time. And if that's true, that ought to be reflected in the history of cosmic expansion, too. People have talked about modifications to gravity and to change the way in which gravity works on large scales, because after all, it's only tested on medium scales like the solar system. Uh, you can do that, but it's very tricky, and Einstein was very good and had uh, an excellent solution to the big scale problem. Uh, and people have had, um, well, I wouldn't say any real great success in picking uh, an alternative theory that uh, other people would say, that's great. Um, usually it's one person, one theory uh, in this field. The other thing to say, and this is actually an important point, is that you can't tell the whole story uh, from the expansion history alone. So what I've been talking about is using the supernovae to measure the history of cosmic expansion. Uh, and it turns out that's not enough to exclude some of these other uh, ideas. You need other information which can come from the way in which galaxies have clustered over time, which I alluded to briefly. Okay. Uh, so uh, what about this uh, dark energy? Is it the cosmological constant or not? Well, we have developed a language for this. Uh, and the language is this uh, index W. This is, <laughs> I didn't know how to turn it. Anyway, uh, uh, W, uh, which is, it tells the relation between, uh, the equation of state, the relation between pressure and density for the dark energy. You may remember, I had that slide a long time ago with Lemaitre. And Lemaitre said, oh look, the dark energy acts, or the vacuum acts, or the cosmological constant acts as if the vacuum has a property as if it has a pressure that's minus rho c squared. And that would be minus one in this picture. So the prediction from the 1930s is that this ought to be minus one. And you can see that the current evidence, where this is meant to be uh, a representation of the probability that you can get all of these uh, data to agree with your model, uh, the, 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 the evidence is pretty good. Well, anyway, it's as good, <laughs> it's as good there's no evidence that it's not minus one. That is, there's no evidence that uh, the cosmological constant is wrong. How can we do better, though? We could make those error 
smaller, and suppose it was at 0.95 or 1.05. That would be really interesting if it turned out that the value of that uh, number was not minus 1. And uh, I'll talk tomorrow to the astronomers and physicists about ways that we think we can do that by making observations uh, at other wavelengths out in the infrared. Uh, well, I can't recommend a better book on this subject uh, than this one. I would just say that in the big picture, that this dark energy puzzle is a sure sign that we do not understand everything about gravity. Uh, we don't know how to understand how to combine gravity with quantum physics. And this is, again, not news, uh, but it means this is another manifestation of that uh, ongoing problem. Okay. Uh, I was going to, uh, so tomorrow I'm going to talk about the future and how to make uh, other measurements. Now I'll just stop with uh, the peroration. So I'm going to skip ahead to the peroration. This, you know, sorry, you have to come to the talk tomorrow to get the, the directed acyclic graph and all that stuff that I know you want. Uh, I do want to say one thing, though, uh, because there's always the possibility that there's someone in the room who's going to be on the Space Telescope time allocation committee, uh, and they won't understand the acronym unless I explain it to them very slowly. So here's the idea. Supernova 1A, that's that kind of supernova we're using, in the infrared, scramble those letters around, and you get <laughs> Raisin, which of course is the, the archetypal tracer of cosmic expansion. <laughs> Whew. Okay, so I'm not going to explain all this stuff. I'm going to skip to the, uh, I'm skip to the uh, philosophical stuff. So here's the idea. We live in a universe where we can, there's some things we can observe. Exploding stars in distant galaxies. They give us the history of cosmic expansion. They tell us about invisible forces at work. You might say, this is a bad idea. The scientists have gone off the deep end. Well, not entirely. You know, if you look outside and you see the trees moving, you say, oh, it's the wind. But you don't see the wind. What you see is the effect of the wind. You see how it makes things move. And in the same way, we think that this battle, this kind of tug of war between the dark matter trying to slow things down, the dark energy trying to uh, speed things up, uh, extends from the time of the Big Bang back uh, out as time goes by, that there would have been deceleration at early times when the universe was dense, and then the acceleration has, uh, has taken place recently, and we see it in this, these measurements of the distant objects. Okay. I told you it was going to be philosophical. Plato. Mmm, good. They don't do this at MIT, do they? So uh, Socrates says, uh, you know, uh, Socrates uh, did, didn't publish much, but he had good graduate students, so it was good. <laughs> Socrates says, shall we make astronomy the next uh, object of study? What do you say? And Glaucon, ha <laughs> putty in his hands. Glaucon says, oh, certainly. A working knowledge of the seasons, months, and years is, a benef is beneficial to everyone, to commanders as well as farmers and sailors. And Socrates says, you make me smile, Glaucon. You are so afraid that the public will accuse you of recommending unprofitable studies. And in the same way, I think we should not be afraid to say that at least some science ought to be on subjects that are not mostly about being beneficial to commanders and farmers, but are subjects that we study because we want to know where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. And they, it turns out that uh, uh, Paul Gauguin studied this. Uh, <laughs> if you go to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, of course, there is this kind of allegorical painting of Tahiti, uh, where he asks, where do we come from? Where are we? Where are we going? Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't get all the way in, though, did they? Yeah. Can you repeat that yeah, I certainly will. So the question is, can we infer anything about the shape of the universe? And now you've gotten trouble. Or 
Well, I know, I know. <laughs> where is the direction to the origin of the Big Bang? So here's where you have to be very careful. Remember I was making fun of those people, like, like Socrates talking to Glaucon. I was making fun of people who thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe, or that the Sun was at the center of the universe, or that our galaxy was at the center of the universe. And in the same way, we think that the Big Bang would be everywhere in the universe at that early time. Here's a way to think about it. We look out now in all directions and we see this glow from the Big Bang from 13.7 billion years ago. Well, okay, suppose it was uh, 3.7 billion years uh, earlier. Then you would look 10 billion years, light years, in all directions. And if you go back and back and back, the anywhere, you, any point you picked, you would see in all directions the, the universe, and uh, it would be a hotter, denser place. When you got back 13.7 billion years, you'd be in the Big Bang. And so would anybody else. Okay, that's the part where I had to wave my hands quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, so there was this uh, Harvard professor, Henrietta Levick. Do you think that she's getting enough credit for the work she has done? For example, is Hubble's work at all possible without Henrietta Leavitt? Yes, yes. So there's uh, Henrietta Leavitt worked at the Harvard College Observatory, uh, first sort of as a volunteer, then she was paid 25 cents an hour. It was her work that uh, uh, discovered this law of um, the properties of the Cepheid variable stars, the vibration of those stars that Hubble employed to measure the distances uh, to uh, nearby galaxies. And her work was very important, and I think she is underrated, although she did in fact get to publish that work under her own name, which was good. Uh, but, you know, in the time, uh, it was the observatory director, Pickering, who had uh, uh, a vision of how to run the observatory. And his idea was to run the observatory, he said, like a railroad. That it would be, and you would have uh, people work at the lowest possible wage uh, under careful supervision, of course. And he hired women to do this. So he hired women from Radcliffe, which was just getting going, from Wellesley, from other places around. Very talented people who, uh, you know, on the positive side, this was an opportunity for them to do real scientific research. On the negative side, <laughs> it, was, it was Pickering, uh, you know, sort of organizing this uh, big effort and, and mostly taking credit for it. Nevertheless, um, uh, it, it's a very interesting kind of moment. And so both uh, Henrietta Leavitt, who I think is kind of under, you know, underappreciated, and, uh, um, and Lemaitre are people whose uh, contributions I think we see more clearly now than people did uh, in the not so distant past. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what about the, yes, I skipped over that, didn't I? That wasn't very good of me. What about the curvature of space? Okay, so, uh, you know, Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity is a theory in which the presence of matter and energy curves space. And so the geometry of the universe is set by its constituents. The thing that's so interesting is that the dark energy has this negative pressure, uh, so it can contribute to the total energy density of the universe and raise that up while at the same time having this kind of anti-gravity uh, quality. So that's an extra Philip uh, that if, if you go back and look in an astronomy book from 1990, people just don't put that in there. They say, that's stupid. Einstein thought that was a big mistake. So. Um, uh, now the question is, what is the, what is the property uh, of the universe and the geometric property? And the way you measure it is just the way you measure curvature, you might measure curvature if you knew that an object of given size and uh, you see it at different distances, you measure the angle. And it turns out this, uh, these fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background are a thing whose size we know, because we understand the physics of that. Uh, and by measuring the angular size of those fluctuations, which is about one degree, which was first done in about the year 2000, so just after 
uh, acceleration results, people have been able to conclude with very good confidence now that the geometry of the universe is the geometry of flat space, the Euclidean geometry uh, that we learned in high school. The more interesting, more complicated kinds of geometry that might take place on a curved surface, either curved like a saddle if the density is low or curved like a sphere if the density is high, seems not to describe the large-scale properties of the universe in which we live. So for mathematicians, you know, it's a great thing to have worked all of this out. The particular universe in which we happen to live seems to be one in which the large-scale geometry is flat to, to fairly good precision, a few percent. You mentioned quantum gravity. I did. What's, but what's the evidence that space-time is quantized? Well, that's a good question. I think the right thing to say is that all the other forces in nature are quantum theories. So we know about electromagnetism and the difference between a universe in, uh, you know, a, a where electromagnetism operates in a setting where there are uh, particles and their antiparticles, their virtual particles being created and destroyed all the time, which is this kind of lively quantum picture for the vacuum. Uh, that picture agrees better with the measurements for electromagnetism than a picture in which you imagine the space having no properties. So that's a point for that. The strong and the weak nuclear forces are also theories of the same uh, character. Um, the question is, you know, what kind of theory will the proper theory of gravity end up being? I don't know the story, you know, and nobody does really, but of course the the, one of the promising uh, approaches that people have is string theory, in which, the, uh, a, in which gravitation looks like the other forces, uh, in which the way you describe it is the same mathematical language as the other forces. So that's a very promising and intriguing aspect of string theories that makes people... Evidence. No, it's not evidence. No, no, it's not. I don't think there is evidence. I think there's a kind of... Uh, oh, this, is the, people are, this is the frontier. And people are trying to think their way to the right idea uh, about the frontier. And I would say that uh, uh, at the moment, there's a very weedy garden of possible ideas with hundreds of ideas, most of which are wrong. <laughs> okay? uh, but it's very hard to tell which are the right ones and which are the wrong ones. Uh, the experimental evidence is kind of weak. There's no um, measurement in the laboratory that tells you about these things. Only cosmic things, only astronomical things <coughs> seem to, uh, uh, you know, because the force of gravity is so weak, they are the only ones that seem to uh, bear on this question really effectively. So it's kind of an unfortunate situation. You know, astronomers knew that the speed of light was finite in the 1600s because they knew the eclipses of uh, the moons of Jupiter, you know, you had to take into account whether the Earth was on the same side of the Sun or the other side, because it takes 15 minutes to get across, and once clocks were good enough, you know, people measured that in the 1600s. Uh, but measuring the speed of light in the laboratory was hard, and it wasn't until the 1830s or 40s, you know, that people were actually able to measure the speed of light in the lab. So I think we're in a similar situation, where, uh, you know, we see the cosmic effects of these things, but we have not yet developed laboratory ways to, to analyze them. And, you know, it's something to be hoped for, but um, the history of doing experiments about gravity is, uh, you know, not got a lot of uh, um, big check marks for uh, being able to do these things. So uh, it, it's really hard, and we hope that people will invent ways to do it, and that it'll, go, it'll turn from being a subject that's only in the astronomical realm to one where there really is experimental evidence on the Earth. Okay, one last question. Ah, yes. <laughs> Why aren't they working about this or on this at CERN? I thought their, one of their projects was that they're trying to prove that there are these particles. Yeah, yeah, well that is part of the picture of how particles work and how they get their mass and so on. Uh, at CERN, their principal activity now is to make it sound like they're doing astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that they, what they say, you, everything you read is, we are recreating the conditions of the Big Bang. So they've learned. <laughs> <laughs>